Hello, I'm Dr. Kathy Sullivan. I'm in the United States Undersecretary of Commerce for Oceans and Atmosphere, which also means I'm the administrator of our National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, which we call NOAA. Uh, I'm delighted to be in the UK this week because I've, I've been in my job as the head of NOAA for a number of years now, and I've had the good fun and, and good times to visit with the directors of UK Met Office and the European Center and UK Hydro in, in our country, in the United States. Uh, but this is my first opportunity to come over to the UK and meet with them and get to see their facilities and meet their teams and get a closer look at how they do their great business as well. The anchor point for this trip was my participation in COP21. NOAA is involved on a couple of fronts. Uh, a number of our teams are involved on the technical negotiations pertaining to monitoring and verification and research, the science and technology underpinning of an agreement or a verification regime. And then in addition, with, especially with the discussions that are open in COP21, around resilience and adaptation and monitoring, uh, NOAA plays a strong role in those fields as well. So I will be going from the UK at the end of this week over to Paris for events in the second week of the COP21 meeting. You know, I think the public still, in a lot of respects, struggles, uh, probably in every country, to make the connection all the way from the science to the phenomena that they're seeing in their daily lives. I think in the climate space, it's not any different. Uh, we live on a complex planet. All of us who've made our living as scientists studying it know that very well. Uh, but the, the detail and the complexity of it can be fairly daunting, uh, I think, to the lay public, to the non-scientific public. In the United States, I would say over the last number of years, I think the perception and awareness is growing strongly that we're seeing significant changes in the patterns that we're accustomed to in our weather and climate. So the understanding that the world of assumptions that we've built our business on or our community plan on, the assumptions about rainfall or, or when do the seasons change or what's the average temperature, in a month, or how often do storms of a certain strength typically hit my town? Many of those things are now changing the scale of people's lifetimes. And I think that does shift the conversation at the grassroots level quite significantly. Um, at the policy level in the United States, there is still a fairly strident debate about what the right policy responses to a changing climate are, what mixture of collective action or technologically based or market based solutions are the right basket of approaches to take. And I think that discussion will continue for a long time in our country. Uh, but the momentum, I would say, does seem to be moving uh, in the government arena, in the national security and defense arena, and to a growing degree in the corporate arena towards a recognition that if the, if the assumptions we've based our economies and our businesses and our societies on, if the assumptions about the weather and climate they're based on are changing dramatically, then we as societies have to be thinking about actions that can either lessen the impacts or make us better able to withstand the impacts that we're likely to see in the future. NOAA has a, a, our central role is in advising government policymakers, the Congress, the, the White House, uh, the other agencies in our federal government, and to a degree also advising um, local and regional level governments as well, counties and states and so forth. Um, we, have, we play a role, I would say, in advising and making this information available to the public, but we don't have a very large or very strong public education and outreach mandate. So you will find in the United States that sort of outreach to the general public happening through universities and through non-governmental organizations. Also to a degree through some of our larger agencies within the federal government that do have bigger education and outreach mandates. Uh, NASA, our space agency for example, has quite a strong remit to be informing the public of what it's doing and the impact and the implications of the work that it's doing. And so as the developer and builder of most of the satellites uh, that monitor the Earth from the United States side, uh, NASA's ability to reach directly to the public can play a very strong role there, and they do quite a fine job of it. But the group on Earth Observations has just launched into its second decade. Uh, when it began in 2005, the sort of application of Earth observation data in situ and satellites to societal questions of importance was fairly thin. Uh, I th would say really it was happening inside universities, but it was not really much in the decision space and in the toolkit 
of, of government policymakers, for example. And GEO set out to do two things. One, to bring governments together in an informal, not a highly procedural way, uh, and show them or persuade them of the value of sharing openly Earth observation data. Because you know, anyone who wants to make a forecast about conditions on this planet more than three or four days in advance has to have data from the entire planet to do it. It's that complex and that interconnected a system. So if you just made measurements in your own backyard or even in your own country, even in a nation the size of the United States, that would still not be enough data to make a forecast more than a few days out. So make the measurements you will, share them as public goods, so that everywhere on the globe we can advance humankind's capacity to, to look ahead, to think ahead, and have, have good information about what's coming What's coming three days out in terms of the weather? What's coming seven or ten days out? What's coming some years out in terms of the climate? And how should I factor that into my decisions? That was GEO's first real big push to get the open sharing of data. As the decade, as the first decade went on though, it began to do more of what you've been getting at, and that is actually construct the, the set of links, the chain that connects the data from a buoy or from a sensor or from a satellite down to an actual societal need. I think a great example is the work GEO has done in global land agricultural monitoring. In with the four most important commodity crops on the world, in the world, rice and soy and maize, and I always forget the other one, sorghum I think. Um, but you know, those are the staple crops that a large proportion of the world's population depend upon, it, often in some of the poorer countries of the world. So how can Earth observations from space help those countries know ahead of the rainfall or ahead of the harvest season whether they'll have a good harvest and be able to feed people? Can you do that with Earth observation data? In a nutshell, the answer is yes, you can get a, a very good advanced look at whether you'll have enough of that crop supply or not. And importantly, you can know that far enough in advance that the prices of those commodities on the market won't have shot up yet because of the the failure of a crop. And so countries will have the opportunity to purchase that uh, crop by the corn at a lower price and still be able to feed their people. So using Earth observations data to help control the volatility in critical food commodities, to provide open information to everyone, to help take speculation out of the market, to help make sure that for societies critically dependent on one of those four staple food crops, that they can get the kind of data turned into information that can help them make a decision and still be able to feed their people. That sort of direct connection to a specific user group and societal need uh, had not really begun to be made when GEO got started. It's grown a lot now, and GEO will continue to advance those sorts of connections in its second decade. Uh, NOAA and the European Center gain a lot of mutual benefits uh, from working together. Uh, the exchange and cross-fertilization of, of good scientific minds and the spurring each other on just in an intellectual sense is, is one of them, but almost, almost the least important though that is. Uh, we have learned over the years from each other about everything from research agendas to computer procurement strategies to specific numerical methods for constructing uh, weather models and for doing the data assimilation, uh, building the algorithms that incorporate data from satellites and other sensors into the models on the front end. As we've each moved along facing different challenges and advancing and improving the models, we've also shared a lot of good information and insight. Different methods of how you couple the oceanic and atmospheric models. Um, how far out can you push a forecast horizon and what has been the, what has been the linchpin of extending that skill set. There's been a very productive, very open, very collegial, I think just the right amount of uh, collegial mutual investment in the common good that comes from advancing numerical weather modeling capabilities globally and a bit of competition for who gets there first. I think it's been a very good recipe on both of those fronts. We surely can do better on numerical weather prediction and at least as importantly in my view of things in connecting the, the model output or the forecast product to the needs of society. Uh, on our side of the pond, uh, in our weather service and at NOAA, we call that uh, decision support. So it's not just write the forecast or put, get the model run and hit send, but actually thinking about who am I sending that to? 
What challenge, what problem, what question are they facing? How might the environmental information or the insight that's contained in my model or my forecast, how might that insight help inform their question? And then actively being part of making that connection between the insight, the knowledge that your forecast or your model app contains, which sometimes is hard to discern for someone who's not a weather forecaster themselves, and actually understanding the problem they're trying to solve. It's a human, it's really a tantalizing human connection problem that often gets unlocked when the forecaster listens more carefully to the thought stream of the person trying to solve a real world problem, like do I need to evacuate that set of homes because they're going to flood? Or you know, how far in advance do I need to get people out of this area to keep them safe? And listening more carefully and realizing, oh, you need this bit of information. You don't need my 43 terabytes of a model. You need that bit of information. And you need it at that time frame, at this scale on the ground. I can do that for you. Uh, and that, that kind of connection right into the decision space uh, of the real world of policymakers and decision makers, I think, is a, one of the areas that there is a huge amount of productive work to do. Well, I think what we're looking at here is a, a global enterprise that is developed, and this is the first time in human history this capability has existed, by the way. The ability to give human beings foresight about conditions they will face, natural environment conditions they will face. Mankind has never before, prior to our generation, had the sort of capability that we have now to have a reliable, actionable ability to say what's the wind and rain and sea going to be 10 days from now. It's, it's so common in our world we forget how extraordinary and novel it is. And we're, it's a new thing and we're really just babies at learning how to factor it into our lives and our societies and our economies. So we have now this enterprise. I don't think it is a numerical weather prediction enterprise. I think it's almost a foresight enterprise. It's a prediction and decision support enterprise. And to keep it growing and becoming uh, more of what its potential is for society will take more than a single thing. It will take continued observations of the Earth, the systems that, that give us the data that we depend on today without conscious thought and care and feeding will run to the end of their lives and not be replaced. Without the observations, this enterprise fails completely. It's critically dependent on the observations. And it will take the human talent. I think it will take uh, the addition of some human talents that are somewhat more oriented towards social science and risk communication and towards making that human bridge between the scientific forecast and prediction enterprise and the societal use enterprise, if you will. I believe that it'll be a couple generations, at least that will be a human connection. Um, and then it will take continuing to uh, keep the toolkit this enterprise up to speed, up to towards the cutting edge, and that, yes, that means the computers and the technical systems that we depend on to crunch all of the data. So everyone always wants you to pick just one thing that it takes, but it's an extraordinary capability to have created. It came about through the investment of time and talent and treasure, and no good enterprise continues and thrives into the future unless you continue to make the right investments of time and talent and treasure. Uh, I, my opportunity to fly in space, uh, as you would expect, is a really pivotal kind of moment in my life. Uh, my fascination from my very earliest days had been about the planet, whether I was looking at it as a globe or as a map or you know, reading the National Geographic magazines to learn about exotic peoples and exotic places. So that was always my driving force. Uh, it propelled me into undergraduate and graduate school as an oceanographer. And it really was, to a strong degree, the thought that I might get to see the Earth with my own eyes from orbit if I got selected, that led me to fill out the painfully long application form that starts the process of being selected as an astronaut. Um, it, you know, looking out the window of a spacecraft cannot replace all the scientific training in terms of what really equips me to understand what NOAA's doing and know the working parts of it well enough to, to serve as its leader. Uh, but I would say, in terms of firing my own passion, um, giving me an ability to you know, speak so strongly and passionately about uh, the dynamic nature of our planet and the importance of continuing to build our capability to observe it, 
and to forecast and predict it. Uh, and I guess in, you know, there's always the attraction of the astronaut ticket. So it's, it certainly serves as a magnet, I think, an inspiration to a number of our customers and to a number of our folks at NOAA uh, that I'm at the helm of the agency and have seen the planet from that vantage point and have come back home to do something like this. It's a pretty good inspiration for me as well.